Okay, everybody, we've been leading up to this moment for quite some time now. Um, and here it is, the partition function of an ideal gas. I'm Tanya Coffey. This is for thermal physics, and we're using Schroeder's text for thermal physics in this class. Now, in a previous lecture, we um, had the partition function worked out for um, the Maxwell speed distribution. And then I hinted in that lecture that if you wanted the um, partition function for a total collection of n ideal gas molecules, that what you would have to do is take the partition function for one molecule, which I'll call z sub 1, right, and then raise it to the power of n and divide it by n factorial. Now to the power of n for the partition function, um, that just means that you've got multiple ones that are interacting and the n factorial in the bottom says that order is unimportant. Okay, so the partition function for one molecule would actually be the multiplication of the partition function for the translational part, which I'll call z sub tr, and for the internal energy part, which I'll call z sub int. Okay, and the int stands for internal, which would of course be rotational or vibrational energy state, something like that. All right, now what we're going to do is we're going to use our definition that the partition function z is the sum over all the Boltzmann factors for all the states. Z is equal to the summation over s of e to the minus es over kt. And that would be true for the z translational and internal energy um, parts. Now I'm going to keep the internal energy part here, but remember that the real goal of all this is to kind of end up at the Sacker tetrode equation and understand in general the equations for monatomic ideal gas. That's really kind of our goal. Um, so uh, we're really going to focus on that translational part and not worry so much about the internal energy part, which honestly we talked about in another um, lecture. Okay, so how would you count up all the possible translational energies of a molecule? Now, one approach would be to think of your ideal gas as occupying some three-dimensional box, okay? And then what you have is a quantum particle trapped in a box. So you've got your um, total volume of your system, and then you would divide that by the volume of a quantum box, right? Okay, so remember that for a, um, a particle in an infinite square well, and this is from Modern Physics 1, and remember that if you've forgotten all of this stuff, I do have review lectures on the particle in the infinite square well, okay? But let's assume that we have a particle of mass m trapped in a one-dimensional box that has a length big L. Okay, and we're going to use n as our quantum number here. So n um, starts at 1 and goes up in integer steps from there. And so what we'd be doing is if we summed over all of the energy um, Boltzmann factors for the energy states uh, defined by our quantum particle in a box, then what we would have is um, the summation over all the energy levels from 1 to infinity of e to the minus h squared n squared over 8m l squared kt. Now remember that your particle in an info box has energy levels of h squared n squared over 8m l squared. Also remember here that h is Planck's constant and um, n's the quantum value for the particle, the, the quantum number for the particle, and m's the mass and l's the length. k is Boltzmann's constant, t is the temperature. Okay, so that's our energy of our state divided by kt, summed over all of them. Now, what we're going to say is that for a reasonable size volume, that these energy states are close enough together that we can approximate this as a continuous function. Now, that is a big jump, and it would break down if we start to shrink our box size down, but that's the assumption that we're going to make for now. And I'm also going to make the assumption that if we've got so many states, that honestly, it wouldn't matter if we started our integration at n equal to 1 or n equal to 0. We'd get basically the same value for our integral anyway. And so I'm going to integrate now from 0 to infinity instead of 1 to infinity. And it's no big whoop because infinity is so big. So we're integrating that Boltzmann factor then um, over all possible values of n dn. Okay, now to do this integration, we're going to do a change of variables. We're going to take what was in our exponent, 
which was uh, h squared n squared over 8ml squared kt. And we're going to set that equal to our substitution variable x squared. Okay. Now that would mean that x would be n times the square root of h squared over 8ml squared kt. And that would mean that dx would be equal to the square root of h squared over 8ml squared kt times dn. Now, that would mean that dn would be equal to dx times the square root of 8ml squared kt over h squared. So, I can plug that in and now do my substitution in my integral. And that would mean that our translational partition function, z translational, would be equal to the square root of 8ml squared kt over h squared times the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the minus x squared dx. Okay? Now, if you look this integral right here up in the tables, then it evaluates to the square root of pi divided by 2. Okay? And so if I plug that in, then what I'll get for my translational partition function is 1 half times the square root of 8 pi ml squared kt over h squared. So that's my, that's my answer. Okay? That's my partition function for an ideal gas there, okay, my translational component of an ideal gas molecule. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, first of all, take that square root of L squared and pull it out, okay, and then I'd have L on top, and then I'm going to take the rest of the stuff that's in this expression, and I'm going to call it 1 over the quantum length, or uh, cursive L sub Q. So, L sub Q would be equal to the square root of H squared over 2 pi M K T, and that's our quantum length. Okay, now you might be thinking, what the heck does that mean? Okay, well, um, it's very close, actually, to the de Broglie wavelength of the particle. Remember our definition of a de Broglie wavelength is lambda is equal to H over P, or Planck's constant divided by the momentum. Now, for a, uh, an ideal gas molecule, the kinetic energy is equal to the total energy, and the kinetic energy is equal to p squared over 2m. So that would mean that I could write my wavelength as h over the square root of 2mk. And then using the idea of equipartition of energy, okay, which I already showed is true, then for the 3 degrees of freedom, I would have a total energy of 3 halves kt, where little k is Boltzmann's constant, and I could plug them for that. And so that would give me a uh, wavelength of h over the square root of 3 mkt. Now, if you'll notice and compare that to our quantum length, this is only off by a factor of roughly square root of 2, okay, in the denominator there, because pi is close to 3, okay, and then so we would basically have, you know, 2 times 3 in the bottom here instead of just 3. And so, you know, this is very close to the de Broglie wavelength of the particle. So you can think of the quantum length as being something on the same order of, the same rough size of your wavelength for your particle. All right, if that helps. Now let's take it to three dimensions. That was all in one dimension. But of course, a real particle would be confined in three dimensions. But honestly, it wouldn't change too much, right? Instead, we would just multiply the values of things times one another, right? Um, if you remember from modern physics, your particle trapped in an infinite square box in 3D, what you did was you just multiplied. Um, and you had quantum numbers for the x, y, and z directions respectively. And so that's shown here, okay? We're going to multiply our x partition function times our y partition function times our z partition function. And if we were to run through that proof for any given direction, of course, what we would get is the length in the x direction divided by the quantum length, the length in the y direction divided by the quantum length, and the length in the z direction divided by the quantum length. And so what we would end up with is just these things multiplied towards one another, right, by one another, okay? Now, if you multiply the x, y, and z dimensions of your box, you've got the volume of your box. So what we've got now is that our, for 3D, translational partition function is equal to the volume of our box divided by the quantum length cubed, which would be our quantum volume, or little v sub q for quantum volume. And to write that out as an expression, the quantum volume v sub q would be equal to h over the square root of 2 pi mkt cubed. Okay? 
All right. Now, remember that our uh, partition function for one particle, Z1, is equal to our translational times our internal partition functions. And that we could now write as V times Z internal divided by V cubed. And then if we wanted that for n particles, what we would do is we would say z is equal to 1 over n factorial times z1 to the n, which would be v z internal over vq to the n. All right, so now remember at any time if you need to take a break and think and pause, be sure to do that, okay? Now what we're going to do is we're going to use the expression for the natural log of z a lot, okay? And so I'm going to show you what the natural log of z is because we're going to need that a bunch. So here we have z is equal to 1 over n factorial times v z internal over vq to the n. That's from the previous slide. And if we took the natural log of that, okay, then it would be the natural log of 1 over n factorial plus the natural log of v z internal over v q to the n power. Okay, now using the rules for natural logs, one, the log of 1 over n factorial is minus the log of n factorial, so that's where that comes from. And then remember that if you raise the argument of a logarithm to a power, it's the same thing as multiplying the power out front. Okay, so what we would end up with is log of z is equal to minus log n factorial plus n times log v plus log z internal minus log of vq, the quantum volume, okay? Remember that if you've got things multiplied together inside of a natural log, that, you know, that's the same as adding or subtracting the natural logs. So that's where that comes from. Now, in a previous lecture, we showed Stirling's approximation. So we're going to use it here. The log of n factorial is approximately equal to n log n minus n. So if I plug that in, then what I've got now is that log of z is minus n log n plus n plus n times log v plus log z internal minus log v cubed. Okay, now that gives us, simplifying and bringing everything into one bracket here, um, log of z is equal to n times log of the volume plus log of z internal minus log of n minus log of our quantum volume plus 1. Okay, so that's the expression that we're going to use for log of z from here on out. Yet again, if you need a second to catch up with the algebra, just pause. Okay, so the first time we can use this is actually kind of neat. Okay, what we're going to do is um, do a little sanity check here. Okay, remember that we used this expression for our average energy. We showed that this was true in a previous lecture. So our average energy E bar could be written as negative one over the partition function times the partial of our partition function with respect to beta, which is equal to minus partial of beta log of Z. Okay, so this is all stuff we talked about before. And remember yet again, beta is one over KT, all right? Now, the expression that we have so far is um, this z for the whole collection of molecules, okay? So we've got a collection of n molecules, and it's the partition function for the whole shebang, okay? So that means that rather than E bar, which is the energy, average energy for one molecule, we've got the um, average energy for the collection if we use our z in here. So that would be our average total internal energy, u. So I could write that u is equal to minus partial with respect to beta of log z. Now, if I plug in my log z from the previous um, slide, see, I told you we were going to use that again, then I would have minus partial of beta times n times log v plus log z internal minus log n minus log of our quantum volume plus 1. Beta is 1 over kt. And what that means is that if we're taking the partial with respect to beta, if the term doesn't depend on t, then that partial will go to zero because remember, partial derivatives look for explicit dependence on the variable. So um, v, that's not going to have any explicit dependence on temperature. n isn't either, and neither is 1. So that only leaves two terms which will have t dependence, okay? So we could write that u is equal to minus partial with respect to beta of n times log of z internal minus log of our quantum volume. 
Now we can break that into two parts. That would be minus n partial with respect to beta of log of z internal, and then plus n partial with respect to beta of the log of our quantum volume. Now anything that appears here would just be u due to internal energy consideration. So it would be like the energies due to rotational and vibrational states. And so I'm just going to break that out here and leave it alone because honestly what we really care about is a monatomic ideal gas expression in this lecture. Okay, Previous lectures dealt with rotational vibrational states. So I'm going to focus on this term right here. Okay, N partial with respect to beta of the log of our quantum volume. Now remember, here's our quantum volume. We defined it not too long ago. It's equal to h over the square root of 2 pi m k t cubed. Now we want the partial with respect to beta. So beta is 1 over kt, so I'm going to take that kt right there, and I'm going to write it instead as beta. So that would be some constants, h over the square root of 2 pi m cubed, times beta to the 3 halves power. Okay, so now when I plug that in here, what I'm going to get is u internal plus n partial with respect to beta, log of the quantum volume. That's equal to u internal plus. Now, anytime you take the natural log of anything, right, then the derivative of that would be 1 over the thing you're taking, right, and then times the derivative of the thing. So that would be u internal plus n over v cubed times h over the square root of 2 pi m cubed times partial with respect to beta of beta to the 3 halves, all right? Now, if I take the uh, partial with respect to beta of beta to the 3 halves, then I would have uh, 3 halves times beta to the 1 half power. So that's where that goes, okay? And then this is the constant from the previous line. Here's my n from the previous line. And the rest of this stuff is just my quantum volume again. Oops. Whoopsie. The rest of that stuff is just my quantum volume again. Okay? So, uh, 1 over my quantum volume would be 2 pi m to the 3 halves divided by h cubed b to the 3 halves. All right? Now, look, a bunch of stuff cancels. This h over root 2 pi m cubed is going to cancel with the terms over here. And then I've got the beta to the 3 halves in the denominator here, which cancels out with part of beta to the 1 half here, right? So that cancels each other out, leaving me 1 over beta. So all I've got left is u internal plus 3 halves n over beta. And n over beta is n times kt. So my internal energy expression, u, is um, u internal, the energy from the rotational and vibrational state, plus... 3 halves in kt. And I know that you're probably sitting there going, oh gosh, she dragged me through all of that to tell me that the internal energy for a um, an ideal gas is 3 halves in kt? Yeah, I did. But look, we just proved it. And that also gives us confidence in our expression for our partition function for an ideal gas, doesn't it? Okay? So um, that's reassuring. Okay, now I know this is a lot, and I know it's very dense. So at this point, I'm going to take a break here. I'm going to call that the end of part one. I hope you understood that, and um, I'll see you in class.